Check one, check one, two, three. Hey everybody, it's Michael Helms, also known as Michael the Sound Guy, and this is the Location Sound Podcast. You know, each episode we talk with location sound mixers, boom ops, and other industry pros about the various aspects of recording sound on location, whether it's for feature and independent films, TV commercials, interviews, any time where dialogue from actors is recorded. I started my career in the recording studios in New York City with some of the big artists back in the day, and later on projects for networks like HBO, Sci-Fi Channel, and the Cartoon Network. As time went by, I got out of the studio and began working in production sound. Whether you're a seasoned veteran or just starting out, thanks for joining us. Before we get started, I wanted to mention our sponsor for this episode, FloridaSoundMan.com. One of our past guests, Joe Giannotti, production sound mixer, has created the Quiet Please Filming in Progress sign. You've probably seen it. It's a 24-inch by 36-inch collapsible sign and now he has the lav organizer and it holds up to five lavalier microphones in a compact pouch and has two external pouches for tape and expendables so visit the product page at floridasoundman.com to check out the products and use promo code lsp for a 10 percent discount that's floridasoundman.com All right, my special guest today is author of the Location Sound Bible, the Sound Effects Bible, and Make Some Noise. He's the sound effects guru and soul patch aficionado. Please welcome Rick Veers. Hello. How you doing, man? Great to have you, Rick. It's good to be on. It's been a couple. We saw each other uh, in Orlando just a couple of months ago. Yeah, it was. So it was in March at PodFest Multimedia Expo, and the COVID-19 thing was just kind of ramping up. And I'm going to say after that, everything shut down. Yep, I think we saw each other at PodFest, and then a week later, we caught up at Full Sail with the, the Full Sail gang. And then, yeah, three or four days after that, the country shut down, and that's been it. We've all been on lockdown ever since. So I like to blame you. I tell my friends, <laughs> it's your fault. You know, we, we went to this massive conference, like, right before everything. So I, I'm glad that, you know, nothing broke out at the conference, you know, when it comes to everybody getting sick. But that was crazy. Yeah, I, I mean, in hindsight, if we'd have known how bad the situation was going to develop would we have went to PodFest? That's because there was thousands of people there, and they were from all over the place. I mean, primarily the states, but there was some people from you know outside of the country as well. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if I would have went again had had we uh, had to make that decision all over again. Yeah. Now, where did you stay when everything broke out? Well, I was in I was in Orlando for PodFest, and then the following week we went up to uh, Full Sail for Hall of Fame, and then literally. The day that Hall of Fame was over, I was supposed to jump on a plane that weekend on Sunday and fly back to Detroit. And at the last minute, something in my gut was like, you know, I don't know if I feel, you know, safe flying because I didn't want to, you know, my kids back here in Detroit. I didn't want to get on a plane and then catch something and then get him sick, you know. So at the last second, I'm like, you know, I'm going to cancel my flight. My fiance, Shanette, and I, we jumped in her car and drove up here. And we have literally been here. Her car has not left my driveway for the last two months. But actually, it ended up happening that on the day that I was supposed to leave to fly back from Orlando to Detroit, they found out that one of the TSA agents had COVID-19. So it's very possible it, had I flown, I could have been exposed to it that way. So the universe was looking out for me. Yes, indeed. Well, Rick, when we usually do the show, we talk about gear and we talk about what's in your audio bag. And I know you've been a longtime user of Tascam and Road products. So, you know, what's your philosophy when it comes to to buying gear, especially when you're first starting out? Oh, well, there's two different philosophies. If you, you know, if you're in your career and you've been doing this a while and you have money, <laughs> the, there's the professional answer. And then there's the, hey, I'm just starting out answer. And so the just starting out answer for me is simple. If it sounds good, you're fine. Uh, but don't wait to till you have like a ten thousand dollar gold plated shotgun microphone before you consider yourself a professional. Use something decent. Use something that's going to sound good. That's not noisy. But the reality is, is this is the the baseline stuff that's available anywhere. B N H photo video wherever you buy your gear. The baseline mics that they're offering now sound so much better than the mics that the Beatles recorded with you know decades beforehand. So. You know, you really have to buy something really super low priced to get 
to get quality that's going to, you know, show up in negatively, I guess, in your production. For the most part, the gear that's out there is is good enough to start off with. So I would say don't let technology get in your way. You know, use whatever equipment you can find that's affordable for you. Rent or borrow. I borrowed uh, a lot of gear at the, for, at the beginning of my career. Uh, but do what you can. And then as you start to make money, as you become a professional, as you become to, you know, you get further along in your career, then you can say, okay, look, this $500 shotgun microphone serve me well, but I'm going to upgrade now to the thousand dollar shotgun microphone. And then you can kind of make those decisions. But the reality is, is that you can sink a lot of money really super quick at the beginning of your career. Uh, that's unnecessary. So start with the staples, start with the stuff that you're, you know, you're going uh, to need and you know that you're going to use and then work from there. Yeah. You know, one of our previous guests and mutual friend of ours is Fernando Delgado. He's the mm. owner of Stickman Sound. Yeah. And uh, he said he's seen people all, all over, and you know, go all in early in their careers. And then they get over their head and they can't pay the yep. bills and, yep. you know, get into serious debt. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's you know, don't go all in so, so quick. Yeah. I mean, here's, the, here, here's a, a surprise for you. If you're just starting out in the career and you want to get the best of everything, you are buying a Lamborghini. Okay. You are buying like way too much gear. Uh, you know, if you get everything that you wanted and the best of everything, dude, you're out a whole lot of money. And from a business perspective, that just doesn't make sense. Start with the staples. My first kit that I bought, I actually had to get a loan. This is a true story. I had to get a loan to get my first kit. It had a the Shure FP33 mixers because that was those were all the rage back in the day. So I had a Shure FP33 mixer. I had a uh, the Tascam DAT recorder, which I think it was the DAP1. Uh, I had a shotgun microphone, a couple of lobs, and uh, a boom pole, headphones, and a stereo microphone. All of that stuff together was like something like just north of ten thousand dollars, and I had just—I mean, literally just graduated from from college. I didn't know what the heck I was going to do. My dad ended up co-signing for the loan, uh, but I had lined up enough projects before I purchased the gear that when the first bill came for the first payment on the loan, I was able to pay the loan off. I never paid a dime in interest. So I had work lined up so that I could make that big purchase. But if I was just starting out uh, freelancing from day one, there's no way I could have made that purchase and then still been able to pay my bills and, and kept my sanity the first year or two. So I always tell people when you're getting started, you know, start slow. Don't try to buy everything all at once because you'll go broke pretty quick. Or you get yourself uh, in a position where, you know, you're struggling to make ends meat and you, you can barely pay your bills on stuff. And whenever you're desperate, you make you make poor decisions. So relax and enjoy. your career is always going to be there. Uh, but start slow. Get the stuff that you know you you know you're going to need. You're going to need a good mixer. You're going to need a couple of good mics. And then just kind of from there start adding. But you don't need, you know, five shotgun microphones and several hypercardioids and you know a you know, handful of uh, lobs to start off with. Start off with one or two mics and, and start working from there. Yes. Now we have a lot of listeners that they didn't plan on working in sound at the start of their careers. And, and you had a similar experience, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm a filmmaker first, then I'm a sound guy. So, I mean, ever since I was a kid, I've made movies. I made so many movies, you know, especially like short movies and stuff. This was back in the day when we had like the VHS camcorders, like the big guys, it's like the small suitcase you had to put on your shoulder and all that. But I've made, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little things like shorts all the way down to professional video series. And I've worked on feature films, and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, I'm a filmmaker first. And then by trade, I became a sound person just because when I moved up to Detroit, I graduated down in Orlando at Full Sail, moved up here to Detroit and was just looking for any kind of freelance work just to get started in the, in the industry. And nobody was hiring for anything. And one of the things that a couple of the companies were telling me was, well, we're not hiring, you know, producers, directors, writers, you know, shooters, but we're looking for sound guys. Do you know any good sound, you know, sound people? And uh, Full Sail, as you know, they're so exhaustive in their training that even though my degree program was in film and television, I spent three months learning phantom power and how to solder and how microphones work and, you know, you know, signal flow through a council. They, they taught us all this stuff from from day one. And a bunch of the kids in my class uh, at the time, they used to complain, we're filmmakers. Why are we learning about sound? And, you know, and I was uh, my my perspective on it was, well, you know, I'm paying a lot of money to go to the school. I the school's got a great reputation, so I'm going to trust that they think that I, I need to know this for a reason. And so I paid attention. I took, you know, really good notes. I asked, way, you know, tons of questions. Uh, partially, I'm also a musician. So before I even got into film school, you know, I, I knew 
you know, microphone basics, really, really basic stuff. So it was, it was interesting to me. And then sure enough, I got out of college and the first thing they were looking for was sound people. And because of the fact that I paid attention and took good notes and, you know, put the effort in, in school, I was able to, my, it took me one gig before I could convince a company that I was decent enough to do sound. And I did such a good job. My first gig out that the very next gig I worked on was a week long show with ESPN working with the Detroit Red Wings. So whatever I did was enough to get the shooter's attention to go, okay, you know, this kid's pretty decent. Let's try putting him on some bigger shows. Oh yeah. Well, you were doing location sound work. So how did it shift over to sound effects? Funny enough, one of the places that I was freelancing at they had a, an equipment room and it had like shelves of gear. They had like five or six different gear packages. So they had six different shelves and each shelving unit was an entire package. So you, you know, had your tripods was at the top then you had your lighting equipment, then you had your camera, then you had all your sound package. And this was like from shelf to shelf. There were six of these shelves. But then they had this magical seventh shelf and it was just all of this miscellaneous gear. And uh, one day I was walking through there and I noticed they had this DAT recorder. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm really trying to brush up on my chops as a, as a sound person because I wasn't a sound person by trade. I was just getting into it. So about a year into it, I was like, you know, if I borrowed a couple of mics from these guys on the weekend, I could grab a debt recorder and I could go test recording anything I could just to kind of get better at mic techniques. So I, I asked them if I could borrow. They said, go ahead. And I'm like, well, you know, I could just start you know, recording sound effects or something just because I didn't have anybody to record dialogue with. And at the time, I was interested in sound effects because of this DAW that I had on my my computer. So the two worlds just kind of came together. And one weekend I borrowed a, um, I borrowed the DAT recorder and, uh, and a shotgun microphone and went out in the field and just randomly went around recording stuff. And the very first day I recorded, I ended up coming across an old junked car. I think it was from like the forties or fifties, but it was like, it was nothing but rust. It was just solid Brown. And it was just sitting on this little tiny hill to where like hill, I mean like two feet in the air. But if I leaned up against it and rocked it, it would make this insanely crazy squeaking sound. So I sit there in the woods, like 20 minutes, like rocking up and back and forth on this car, making these squeaking sounds. And I was recording sound effects. Those sound effects, that very first day, ended up in shows like Sons of Anarchy. In fact, if you've ever seen the series, they're at halfway through the series, they blow up the main clubhouse of the, uh, the motorcycle club. That squeaking sound is in that explosion. Uh, it's at the very end of the explosion. You hear this little hurt, but that's the that was for my very first day of recording. And I wasn't trying to record sound effects. I was just trying to improve my mic techniques. Man, yeah. And your sound effects have been in TV, radio, movies, video games, and things like that. So, uh, what's been your most favorite use of your work? Well, it's always fun. It's always fun to hear your stuff, especially when you're not paying attention or you're not expecting it. So a lot of the, most of the guys that work in the industry, they get hired to work on a show. So they know, hey, I'm making sound effects for the next Halo video game or I'm making, you know, for the next Marvel movie. Me, that's not how my career went. I would just make stuff and then it would end up in libraries and collections that would get sold and licensed to the studios and, you know, the independents. And then from there, they didn't have to pay royalties on it. It was royalty free. So they could use it for anything they want. So they never had to tell me what they were using it on. So the only way I knew if my stuff was being used is if somebody told me, hey, I used your stuff in something. Uh, or if I'm just, I'm playing the video game or I'm watching the show and then I'm like, hey, I remember that. And so recently, as it was, this was a few years ago, but Jurassic World, there's this scene where um, they're walking through the uh, field at night and there's a raptor in the field and somebody takes a bazooka and they shoot the bazooka at the raptor and it blows up, right? And I'm in the theater and I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's my bazooka sound. It wasn't a bazooka. It was a missile sound, the effect that they used. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's mine. But I never take credit for anything unless I know for sure that it's mine. Because, like, there's a lot of missile sounds out stuff. And then, sure enough, I found out that the sound designer that was doing that show uh, used a lot of my content in it. And he was a big fan of the, you know, the stuff I produced. I'm like, no way. That's actually my sound effect. And it's the same missile sound that's used in the Lego Batman video game series. So anytime you're in any of the vehicles and you fire the little rocket that comes out of the ship, that's the same sound that they use for the uh, for the bazooka in uh, in Jurassic World. So I, I like those moments where I'm just like, hey, I didn't expect to hear that today. Or, you know, the very first time I played Halo was actually with my kid. They had the Warthog. And I, that's another thing. Yeah, I forgot about the Warthog. So the Warthog, it's this like vehicle you drive around in. And if you crash in anything, it makes this like, you know, car crash sound like this metal sound. I actually recorded that. Um, some of that stuff may have been from the very first day, but certainly a few months later, I ended up uh, in a junkyard recording a whole bunch of stuff in a junkyard. And those sound effects ended up uh, in the Halo video game. Man. 
Man. So uh, how many sound libraries do you have now? In terms of products that I've produced, it's close to 700. I, I, I don't know what the total count. It's like 680 something or whatever. I, I, you know, I really, I'm not producing libraries anymore so much. I've, I've got a totally different focus now, but it's like, it's going to agitate me to not produce 20 more libraries and like hit that 700 mark just so that I could say that I did it. But right now I've got so many other things that I'm focused on that uh, I haven't produced anything. The The newest products that we've come out with recently uh, are the Podcaster Effects series. So we have two of those out, Podcast Effects 1 and Podcast Effects 2. So they're MP3 sound effect libraries that are specifically for guys that are doing podcasts. Do you have a sound effect philosophy when you're recording that, you know, maybe someone that's getting out there, just getting started and they're trying to get some sound effects? You know, what, what do you recommend? My philosophy from day one, from the very first time I, I hit record, was I only want to record the sound of what I'm pointing the microphone at. So if I wanted to record the sound of a car door closing, I didn't want to hear dogs barking in the background or I didn't want to hear wind whistling through the trees. So I was really... Um, I was a purist, so and I still am. But to me, it's like if I want to sell somebody that you know the sound effect of a car door closing, I only want it to be the sound of the car door closing. So I went through great, and I still do. I, I go through great lengths to isolate my sound or to eliminate background noises and all that kind of stuff. I guess so. That's probably my overall philosophy. Is I know that once I get it in post, I can do just about anything I can ever possibly imagine to the sound provided that the sound is pure to begin with. So I always tell people that it's like making pie. Grandma's pies always taste better than like the pies you get at Big Boy or, you know, you know, a restaurant or something. And the reason why they taste better is because grandma always uses fresh ingredients, right? It's like, you know, she buys the best produce or the best fruit to put in her food and all that kind of stuff. And so I kind of look at sound effects the same way. You know, the more pure the original sound sources uh, that I'm using to deal with, the, the better the overall sound is going to be. Yeah, yeah. Well, let, let's take it back a, a few years to your first book. So uh, what was your motivation in writing that book? When Sound Effects Bible came out in 2008, the whole reason I wrote the book was because I had spent 10 years looking for a good book on sound effects. So I was looking for a book so that I could better my craft. I was looking for like tips and tricks and, you know, and the internet was still coming out and all that kind of stuff. It'd been around for about 10 years, but um, there really wasn't a whole lot of like blog sites and there certainly wasn't user groups. Like now you can jump on Facebook and there's like 20 different, you know, sound effects groups that join. There wasn't anything like that when I got started. And so um, I was sometimes was actually cold calling sound effects guys and sound designers out in LA and just hoping they would talk to me. And sure enough, a lot of them did. I was really surprised at how many really cool people. Charles Maines was one of the first guys I talked to. He was really easy and approachable. So I was just looking for, for people to connect with. And uh, I certainly was looking for books. And I couldn't find anything. And then finally, I found this book online. And I'm like, I'm going to buy this book. And, and I'm, this is probably going to have what I'm looking for. The book arrived. I opened it up. There was three pages on sound effects in the entire book. It was stuff I already knew. And it was stuff where if you're any kind of a movie buff and you watch like the behind the scenes tutorials on DVDs, you've heard all of these stories. So the book didn't really help. The book was by a good friend of mine. Uh, it was a great book, but it wasn't sound effects driven. And that's when I looked at the back of the book and I'm like, all right, who's this publisher? And I found out who the publisher was and I just sent him an email and said, look, I'd like to write a book on sound effects. You know, here's who I am and what I've done. Let's talk. And within two weeks, I had a, a book deal. And then um, I think it was a year later. Uh, is when the Sound Effects Bible came out. So the Sound Effects Bible is essentially everything I learned in the first, I think it was 10 or 15 years or whatever of my career. All the mistakes I made, all the tips and tricks that I was learning from, you know, happen chance or, you know, mistakes or by, you know, people that were pros in the industry that were sharing tips with me. And so I felt like if it took me 10 years to find a book, it shouldn't take the next person that long. And so I was like, all right, if nobody's written the book, I'll write the book. And then, you know, at least we've got something to start with. If somebody wants to write a better book, rock and roll, go ahead and do it. But at least we've got something to start with. And that was the whole purpose behind the Sound Effects Bible. And then Location Sound Bible came out. It was the same concept. There was a, There's a couple of good books out there on Location Sound, but there was nothing that I think that was like Bible-esque. Nothing that was like, all right, look, if you're going to have one book on your cart, you know, on your sound card or in your bag, have this book because it's going to have like all the stuff. And truth be told, there's been times when I've been on location and I've actually grabbed my book. I'm like, how, how does this work again? <laughs> so I wanted it to be like, the reason I came up with the word Bible for the books it had nothing to do with the content of what I was writing. It was when we were in film school, there was the film Bible. 
think it was called the Cinematographer's Bible. It was known as the Bible of, you know, for cinematographers. And I want, I wondered, you know, I'm like, I wonder if anybody's done anything like this for sound. And I looked around and nobody did. And that's why I came up with Sound Effects Bible and Location Sound Bible. It was the same idea was this is a good book to have, uh, you know, with you when you're on on set. Good resource. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Yeah, we, we've had a lot of uh, guests that I've talked to about that they had that book on their shelf, the Location Sound Bible, and that's what kind of helped them get started. So it's kind of nice. It's great to hear from people that are like, man, that book really helped. I'm like, well, there you go. That's what I wanted it to do. That was the whole purpose of it. Yeah. Now, you also had a, an unscripted internet series based out of your studio in Detroit called Detroit Chop Shop Video Diaries. Can you tell us a little bit about that one? Yeah, we did. We did six seasons of that show, actually. And the the idea behind the show was I would have interns uh, from around the world that would come and apply and then intern at the chop shop and we would make a product together, sound effects product. And we would document from day one all the way to the release of the product, we would document the process of making the library. And I would show them, you know, anything and everything they would need to know on how to make the sound effects library. And at the same time, I would bring in another intern who was a video producer and I would literally give them the show. You're producing the show. You do whatever you want. And the whole purpose for that was because it was super hard to produce anything when you just get out of film school. Like nobody wants to hire you to produce anything. And I wanted to give somebody the opportunity to produce a show and some of the shows, I mean, these seasons are like, you know, 10, 12 episodes. There's behind the scenes content. And so it gave the video producer that intern walked away with a, a reel to show people. And some of them have went on to become like Emmy nominated, you know, editors and video producers. So the, the idea behind that was I had one set of interns that were helping me make the libraries record and edit and all that stuff. And then I had another intern that was following me around with a camera and interviewing all of the interns about their experience at the chop shop. All right. Yeah. Do you have any crazy? on set, you know, of that unscripted series stories that you can share? Everything, <laughs> everything on that show was crazy. Everything, yeah, everything was nuts. One of the rules that I had when, uh, from day one, actually, is at the end of each week, the video producer would sit down each one of the interns and interview them and ask them about what was going on throughout the week and their experience. So the rule was this, I could not know any of the questions and I could not be present for any of the answers. Like I didn't want anybody to be intimidated and I didn't want them to come up with answers because Rick was in the room. So I'm like, I don't want to know about it. I just want to watch the episode. Good luck. And that kind of allowed the interns to open up and, you know, really kind of say what was on their mind. And sometimes they would take shots at me, you know, most of the time it was, it, it was in good fun, but, uh, but I really wanted it to have a live real unscripted feel. I'm just say whatever comes to your mind, you know, same thing when we're in the field, for the most part, I try to plan my days, especially if I'm taking a lot of gear and people and time out, in the, you know, out in the field. Um, I want to have things lined up, but sometimes it's just, Hey guys, let's go on an, an adventure. Let's just go out today with a bunch of gear and see what we can come up with. And sometimes those end up being the most fun, uh, the funnest days, I guess, uh, that we, we would have is just go out exploring and see what you would come, you know, come across. That's good. Well, you and I, you know, both went to Full Sail University in Winter Park, Florida. And, you know, I did the audio engineering program and ended up going to the studio side. But you doing the film program and then you really wanted to kind of give back to the students and you, you go back on a regular basis every year. So when you visit the students, you know, what advice are you usually trying to give them to kind of get them in the right mindset? Well, the first thing I, I try to tell everybody that I, that I speak with, whether they're interns or people I'm lecturing, is that you can absolutely achieve anything you want, period. Uh, the, the main thing is, is if you have a dream or you have a goal or something, you can absolutely do it. Do whatever it takes to achieve that goal. Absolutely. But um, that's the main thing is, is that anything is possible. And if you put enough effort and time into something, uh, you'll end up seeing results. I never thought I would, my journey would take me where I'm at now. It wasn't, it wasn't, certainly wasn't the goal per se when I first started, but it's been a heck of a ride and I've had a lot of fun doing it. But um, the main thing is, is I, you know, I give back as much as I can. The interns that I have, the sponsors, I've got like over a dozen sponsors that we work with, like Sony and Rode Microphones and Tascam and all that stuff. And I would call these people and say, listen, I don't need any gear. I've got a studio full of gear. I've got all the gear I would ever need. However, my kids don't. And they're getting ready to, you know, once they've finished the internship program, they're getting ready to freelance or start their own businesses or go out there and look for employment. You guys should help them and give them gear and software and stuff like that to get started. And so the last, I think it's 10 something years at the studio, we've given over a quarter of a million dollars in sound effects, gear and software to help the kids get started. So I'm a big fan of, of giving back as well. Little known fact, 
I've never once ever charged to do a lecture. So anytime anybody wants me to come in, hey, you want to come to my kids, you know, come down and, you know, visit and speak with my kids or jump online or Skype, I always say, yeah. And I always, I always do it for free. If they have a stipend or they want to give me something rock and roll, but it's not required. That's great. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate you giving back too. Yeah. I mean, I enjoy it. To me, it's like, you know, it's like when you, you want to swim, you know, if you want to move forward, you got to push the water behind you. Right. So it's just like that, that karma philosophy of, you know, if you want to propel yourself, you got to help propel other people. Nice. Well, what has been your your best career moment up to this point? Wow. I've had a bunch of them. I mean, it was certainly fun being inducted in the Hall of Fame at Full Sail, mainly because my kid was there. <laughs> that was a big moment to have my kid looking up to me. Oh, my gosh, my dad's winning an award, you know, because I'm a sound effects guy. Like, they don't give awards to sound effects people. I mean, they do in Hollywood. If you're, you know, straight up doing movies and stuff, you can win, an, you know, an Oscar for sound editing and things like that. But um, in general, like my entire career, I never would have thought I would have won anything or, you know, so that was definitely a moment. Uh, giving away gear and software to the interns has been a big moment because every time I do that, I'm like, yes, this was this was worth it. This made the entire summer of hanging out with these kids worth it to be able to help them get started. So those are always big moments. Seeing my interns go on and, and watching their names in, in credits of shows, that's always a big moment. One of my interns, in fact, she just texted me last night just to check in. She lives in Texas now. Sydney Johnson, who was my intern uh, in season three, she was on the first all-female NFL film crew. So they had a producer, a shooter, and she was the uh, the sound mixer. And all three of them were females. And, uh, and she took a picture. She, uh, you know, she, there she is on the field. You know, the first all female NFL crew. So those are kind of cool moments when you see them go on and succeed. Yeah. Now we always ask this popular question, but what was your worst on set experience? You don't have to mention any names or places, but if you could kind of generally, what was like the worst? It could have been a an equipment malfunction. It could have been. Um, it's always <laughs> going to come down to equipment. When you say worst, the first thing I think of is equipment malfunction because if you're even a halfway decent sound person, it's pretty much you just set the levels and they're pretty good to go. It's usually when you have problems, it's because oh the mic's not working anymore, or the cable broke. Or I've had somebody one time on set run a uh, a cart over one of my cables and disconnect the, the yeah that was actually a pyro gig i wasn't doing sound for that but i had somebody run uh, i was i was doing pyro for limp biscuit <laughs> <laughs> You know, my career was going places when I'm doing pyro for Limp Biscuit. This was in the 90s. But um, before I got into sound, I used to be a full-fledged licensed pyrotechnician. So I used to do concerts and, you know, theatrical productions and, you know, movies and stuff. Blowing up cars, lit people on fire, you know, theatrical pots, all that kind of stuff. So at any rate, um, Limp Biscuit had hired me to produce a pedal that, I forget the guy's name, Fred something or the other, whoever the singer was. So he wanted to, like, during the show, he wanted to set off the pyro, not me. He wanted to trigger the pyro. And I'm like, all right, listen, I can't legally let you just shoot stuff off. You have to be licensed. However, I can give you a pedal on the stage that's connected to a board that I have off the stage. And you can press that all day long. And unless I hit the arm button, that button doesn't do anything. So technically, I'm setting off the pyro. So they agreed to it. So we set up a test. And um, it was during sound check. And sure enough, right before the test, some you know stagehand literally drove a thing right over top of my cable and cut the cable. So right in the middle of the song, Fred's expecting to see, it was concussion mortars. He wanted these big explosions to go off. So he kept stomping on the pedal and no pyro was happening. That was a pretty bad moment. He called me a few things that I can't say on the air. Uh, and I had to go get a new cable and yeah. So at any rate, that was definitely anytime when they're looking at you going, how come your job isn't working the way it's supposed to? I had another thing. Um, I used to do a lot of stuff with Eminem back in the day because he was based out of Detroit as well. And so we would do a lot of the behind the scenes or, you know, video interviews and things like that. And so working with Marshall was fun because the dude was chronically five hours late always. Like if he had... I used to get calls from his producer. He's like, listen, I only need you for a half day. I'm like, what does that mean? Well, we're just doing one interview. It's only going to last 15 minutes. Can you give me your half day rate? I'm like, listen, dude, it's going to end up being a, it's going to be a full day with overtime before he shows up. No, no, no. Just give me a half day rate. Half day. Sure enough. Okay. Be here at 12. Dude, Marshall wouldn't show up to like six o'clock in the evening. So we are already into a full day. And then he would, he would come in, then he would take forever to get in the room. And so anytime he, if it was just a quick interview, I got overtime out of the deal. That was just, that was Eminem's thing. So sure enough, I sit around for six hours, 
like doing nothing. This was before smartphones. Like, so it wasn't like I could sit around and check email all day. Like I'm just sitting in a room at a studio. They had a couple of arcade games, but that was it. So I'm sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. Finally, Marshall rolls in. He sits down. I've already had the gear set up and turned on. I've checked out the lav. I had, I always run a boom and as a backup and put a lav on them, the whole nine yards. I had the chair set up. We're like ready to rock and roll. I'd already had two meals now at this point in the day. As soon as he sits down and I put the mic on and we get a buzz. Ugh. And we have no, to this day, I have no idea where the buzz came from. You know, I can't prove that it was aliens, but it was something like something came into that room and then created electromagnetic interference. It was like, nah. So as soon as that happened, the producer looks at me and then Marshall's like, what's going on? And I'm like, I've literally got seconds to figure this out. I've had six hours to set up. As soon as he sits in the chair, then I get the buzz. We never did figure out what the problem was. If I remember correctly, his lav was hardwired. With XLR. So I swapped it out for wireless, I think, and that killed the problem. If I remember right, this was a long, this was 15 years ago. But um, but it's those moments where it's like, you know, you're ready. You're sitting around, you're like drinking coffee, life is easy. And then they're like, all right, let's roll. Then all of a sudden there's a problem. Those are the moments that that get me. Because I'm an overachiever. I don't want to screw up. And then when it happens and everybody's looking at you, you're just like, you got seconds to solve this problem. That's why I never, ever, ever show up anywhere without having two of everything. So if the recorder dies or the mixer dies, I got another one in the car. You know, if there's a, if one of the mic goes or a cable, if I need two lobs, I'm going to bring four. I'm just always live by that rule of, you know, be a Boy Scout and have more than what you need. Yeah, yeah. Now, I was working on a short film and the same mic transmitter that the that the, one of the lead actresses was wearing, they, I mean, it had been fine all day. And then all of a sudden, actually, we were shooting on uh, the back lot at Full sale for this short film project. So, you know, yeah, you have a backup. You just run over there, plug in a new transmitter, boom, 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 done. You have, you, I didn't have any time to, to re-mic anybody or do anything. So, yeah, you just switch out the pack. You're good to go. But, yeah, but if you don't have it, now what do you do? I had the same thing happen to me with batteries. So, I, I, in fact, I, I think I mentioned the story in the Location Sound Bible. So, one of the things I was told from day one was that where batteries were cheap. They're like, they're only two bucks a piece, throw them away. And I'm like, what do you mean? And the, uh, it was one of the, the shooters that was telling me, he's like, listen, you never want to get in a scenario where we're shooting and then all of a sudden their wireless lob dies. If we're in the middle of a take or something, they're like, it's only two bucks for the battery. Throw the battery out, put a new nine volt in. So I was always taught, throw out nine volts like they're candy, you know, or at least recycle them or whatever, but dispose of them responsibly, but always start with brand new, fresh batteries. And so I've always lived by that rule. So we were doing this thing for, um, it was a presidential campaign. This was back in two. Th- uh, 1999 it was a 2000 uh, election. So I was following around Al Gore on a riverboat for a week for MSNBC. So the gag was uh, we went from Chicago all the way down the Mississippi to Missouri. So how it worked was me and the shooter were in a van. We would get out at the city and we would show Al Gore getting on the riverboat. It was like, you know, it was a big paddle boat, you know, and he would take off down the river. Then we would jump in our car, race ahead on the road to the next city show up, get set up. We had to go through security because he was the vice president at the time. So we had to go through secret service, had to check down all our gear and check us out. And then we would go into the next venue, set up, check our levels, check camera. And then boom, he would show up off the riverboat, jump on stage, do his spiel. Then he would get off the stage, jump back on the riverboat. And then it was the same thing all over again. He would go down the river. We would race to the next city and we would do this for the entire week. And so, and it was always the same thing. I would show up at the venue. I would throw out the batteries. These are bad batteries. I got to have fresh batteries. So an Al Gore takes the stage. I've got fresh batteries. So in prepping for the trip, I brought bought a couple of cases of, you know, bulk Duracell batteries or whatever it was. I think it was Duracell. Actually, it was Duracell batteries. I bought a couple of cases of Duracell batteries, brand new. And so we get to one of the venues. I throw in the batteries. As soon as he goes to take the stage, like you could see him approaching the stage, my battery dies. And I'm like, wait a minute. This doesn't make sense. These are brand new batteries. Not like halfway, like slightly used. There's a brand new batteries. So I quickly, and I always carry extra batteries on me. So as soon as it happened, I opened up the, the hood to the uh, FP33, threw out the batteries, threw in some new batteries, closed it up, turned it on. Those died too. And I'm like, what the heck? So I went through an entire, like, I did this three or four times. I swapped them out. But the entire case, brand new batteries, the entire case was dead. And here's Al coming up to the stage. And sure enough, out of nowhere, this 9-volt battery just appears in front of me. And I looked up, and there's another sound guy who saw me freaking out. And he gave me one of his batteries. I was like, here, take this. 
And so I popped them in, threw out all of those batteries. I had to go um, buy another, you know, cases of batteries at, at one of the stores. But, you know, it was like one of those superstitious things. Like, I'm like, I'm never using Duracell again. And then I think I switched to Energizer for like 10 years. I'm like, I'm never going to trust Duracell again. Not that it was Duracell, but but that was one of those times where I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I'm prepared. I have fresh batteries. I have cases of fresh batteries. And sure enough, for whatever reason, they just, they died on me. So it's those moments where you panic, like, I've got to solve this problem right now. Because it's not like we can ask Al Gore to go, can you go back to the boat and do this again? We got to you know reset for sound purposes because i'm like one of 20 different news crews and there's like you know probably a thousand people standing around waiting for al gore to give his campaign speech so yeah yeah i was i was using some uh energizer lithium ion the ultimate batteries and i was somebody said somebody recommended it. And i was like oh, yeah, i'll give them a try those things like lasted like a day and a half and they were like on all day and i was like i was blown yeah. away at how good they were I loved lithium batteries, but the problem was the drop off was just, it was, they would last like 95%. And then that last 5%, they would just fall. It would just drop like a rock and you would lose power within a matter of minutes. So it wasn't like it would slowly start to lose charge. It would be like, I'm a hundred percent. And then all of a sudden it'd be like, I'm now dead and it would just die on you. So the lithiums are nice if you're not doing live shots or things like that. Uh, Cause they do, they last forever. They would let, you know, in general, they would last you for a day or two. You know, if you had the wireless is on all day or whatever your gear on all day, but I try to, I shy away from them just because you don't know when they're really going to die. Like it can be only 50% battery, but it'll show up as being a hundred percent or pretty close. So I always shied away from lithium batteries. I'd rather pay the extra couple bucks and be able to sleep at night. But see, that's the thing. Even when you spend the money and you buy brand new batteries, they still die on you. So it's Murphy's law is in full effect when you're doing any type of, you know, film production or, t- you know, TV production. Yeah, that's great. Well, uh, you also have a podcast now called Wild Tracks. So tell us about that one. Yeah. In fact, we need to have you on the show, too. Uh, as soon as we start to shoot again, we uh, well, we've supposed to have been shooting this entire time. But uh, because of COVID-19, like we everybody shut down. So I can't bring Gary can't come over to shoot and I can't have the tech come over and, and switch. So we just been on kind of lockdown. Uh, although maybe we should do some episodes on Zoom Recorder or something. Use Zoom and just uh, shoot some shows that way. But the idea behind it is it's a behind the scenes show about anything behind the scenes. So it's not audio based. It's anything. It could be film production or it could be you know acting or anything you know that's entertainment based. But the idea is we just we we get a professional on or someone who's got experience in you know in the industry in that field, and then we talk about everything from how they got started to what they're doing now, and you know give advice to the audience on how they can you know take their career to the next level that's nice yeah i saw the one episode where you actually interviewed chris curran our mutual friend and chris has the podcast engineering show and the podcast engineering school and and actually he and i started off in the same studio and and so it was funny because i was listening to all these stories i'm thinking i was there (laughs) i witnessed that were you there with the ten dollar milkshake or something i can't remember what it was i remember hearing about it but but yeah Yeah. good times crazy in the studio for sure (laughs) Yeah, he had some experiences that were kind of similar with uh, the experiences we had with Eminem on, you know, the outrageous orders and, you know, things that big celebrities get to ask for. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember the one uh, he was talking about Biggie Smalls, but we had one where, you know, we set up for the session at 6 p.m. He's supposed to arrive at 6. Of course, he didn't show up till like 9 or 10. He, oh, of course, yeah. He, he worked He worked for an hour and then he left and then he was, I'll be back. They went to the clubs. And then like at about 2 a.m., we're all sitting around, you know, trying to keep our, our eyes open. And he calls us, oh, yeah, we're not coming back tonight. And like, all right. <laughs> there you go. Yep. That's my Biggie Small story. Yep. Yeah, we had uh, we had many. Now, the thing with Marshall is that, I mean, Marshall was notoriously late. No two ways about that. But uh, beyond that, I never had any issues. Like, he was always a nice guy to work with. He kept to himself. He was, he was definitely more introverted. But, you know, he was never rude or, you know, and all that kind of stuff. He was a professional. He knew what he wanted to do. And, you know, usually uh, when he wasn't working, he'd squirrel away in the corner and grab a notebook and start writing lyrics and stuff like that. So he was, yeah. He, he showed up and did his job. Same thing with, uh, we used to do a lot of stuff with Kid Rock. And um, Kid Rock was the same way, but he was a little bit more drunk. <laughs> Not that he was an alcoholic, but he was just, he, just, he was Bob. He was going to show up with a beer, say hi to everybody, do his thing, and then walk away with a big smile. That was that was kind of what it was like to work with Kid Rock. But I haven't had any, there's only a, a handful of um, celebrities I worked with that, you know, they had an issue or they were having a bad day or anything like that. But in general, the people I worked with were always kind of cool. Let's see. Last time we talked, you were working on some feature films. Can can you share anything with us about that? 
Yeah, actually, we're uh, we're actually at the financing stage. And so the shutdown the last couple of months has been helpful for us because it's allo- allowing us to work with the investors and get all of our ducks in a row. But right now, uh, we've got two feature films that uh, that we're producing. And that's about as much as I can say about that. I can't give away too much. <laughs> but I will say this, though, it's going to be very much like uh, the Chop Shop Video Diaries, except instead of making sound effect libraries, we're going to be making movies. Okay. So I still have that, uh, that mentor slash teacher heart. You know, I still want to give back to the next generation. So we're going to see what we can do with these projects and kind of open them up for the uh, the next generation of filmmakers. All right. Now, uh, you've also done a, a fantastic job of promoting your brand. And so, so what could you recommend to other sound people that are trying to promote themselves? There's a lot of tips I would give people. Number one, understand that Facebook is a giant window in which people can look into your lives. And so the one thing I did was uh, I just keep everything neutral. Uh, I keep my personal life off of Facebook. I post somewhat personal things, you know, like, hey, this is me and my kid at Disney World or whatever. But but in general, you know, I try not to be controversial and I don't I don't get political and I don't want to sit there and be negative and bash things like that. People will remember stuff like that. When they find out about who you are, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to hit social media. And if you got a bunch of garbage and stuff on there that that's going to turn people off, then they're going to be interested in your brand then anything else you have to say is just not of interest to them. So that's what the first thing I did was on Facebook because I just try to keep everything kind of cool and try to stay positive. The second thing is consistency. You know, have a message, have a thing that, you know, a vision of what you're trying to do with your brand and just stay true to it. There's been a couple of people that uh, that wanted to work with me or intern or whatever, and I was interested until I saw their Facebook feed, and I'm like, I don't want to be around that kind of a person. <laughs> I don't want to be around all that negativity or you know or whatever. Uh, and then there's been other people I was on the fence about working with, and I went to their page, and I'm like, you know, this seems like a pretty decent person or whatever. So just know this: anything you put out on social media will come back to haunt you at some point in your life, even if it's 10 or 20 years down the road. So just remember that when you're posting. If not, it's not that you can't have an opinion. It's not that you can't be negative or talk about all this. You can do anything you want. So have an alter ego page. Have a page where it's like, you know, it's your name spelt differently or something. And then add all your friends there that be negative on that page. But on your brand page, keep it cool. Keep it PG-13 or PG, you know what I mean? Uh, and don't be negative because people do look for that stuff. Now, you know, you're, you're all over the world doing business and things like that. So, and you have a family, many of us have family. So how do you balance personal and business life? Well, when I'm traveling, there's, you know, there's really not a whole lot I can do about that because if I've got to be out of town, I got to be out of town. It's easier now because my my kid, he's my kid, my grown man now. He's going to be 18 um, in January. So, so it gets easier as he gets older, but in general, um, you know, family first. I've always, always, always lived with the philosophy of family first. Here's the thing. You can always make more money, but you can't make more time with your kid. That's a ticking clock. Like once it's over, it's over. Once they're grown, that's it. You can't go back, but you can always go back and make more money or do more jobs on stuff. So my kid always came first. My uh, family always came first, and um, I wouldn't let anything interfere with that. And I spent a whole lot of time with my kid when he was growing up, so I'm pretty happy as a parent with the time I did spend with him. So I don't have any regrets there, but that was the whole point. I didn't want to wait until he graduated from high school and then look back and go, oh, I should have been spending more time with my kid this whole time. I didn't want to have that regret. So, um, you know, in moderation, you know, I, I worked the big gigs and there was times where I was out of town for a little bit longer than I wanted to be. But in general, I would always make it up to him. You know, I'd always, uh, you know, spend more time with him in the summer or on the weekends or this, that and the other when I did go out of town. But um, but now that he's getting older, I am going out of town more often. But that's only because, you know, he's getting older. Yeah. Well, Rick, uh, this is this has been great. I know we we're kind of wrapping things up here, but uh, you know, do you have any final words of wisdom that you can share with people? You know, maybe getting started in the industry right now. You will only get better if you keep doing it. Period. Like, no, it doesn't matter what you're doing if it's in this industry or any other industry. I always use. Um, I don't know why I use Jimmy Page. It's like a fifty year old reference, but like Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin, the, you know, legendary guitarist. I guarantee you, the way that he sounds when he plays the guitar today does not sound anything like it did the very first time he picked up a guitar. Like I guarantee you, first time that dude grabbed a guitar, it sucked, right? And I bet you the next time it sucked but it sucked a little less, right? And then you just keep chipping away at it. And then before you know it, you're the legendary Jimmy Page. So my thing is, is that pay attention to your time. 
you have opportunity to improve your career, but are you taking that opportunity and using it to play video games instead? Or are you wasting it on social media, you know, or this kind of thing? So um, there's always little moments in your life that you can use to improve who you are, practice or all that kind of stuff. It's just a matter of, are you using those moments or are you spending those moments on things that don't really matter? So that's the thing is, is that um, a lot of the people that I know that are successful now that are my age are the guys that instead of hanging out with their buddies on the weekend, they would spend the weekend digging through manuals and learning gear or, you know, doing what I did. You know, I, I went out on the weekend with a borrowed debt recorder and a microphone just so that I could get better at using microphones. And that ended up leaning into a career in sound effects. So the idea was I was always looking at ways to kind of improve my, improve my craft. So always be doing that stuff and always be improving your craft and your technique and know this. There is no time in your life ever at which you're going to reach the finish line. Like there's no like, I know it all now. Like you're never going to, you know, maybe 10,000 years from now, you might know it all. But until then, just know that you're always learning. There's always, always, always going to be somebody that knows more than you. And that might be somebody that's half your age. That's one of the things that the interns taught me is I always thought, well, you know, I'm the mentor. They're the interns. Therefore, they can just learn from my knowledge. And they would show up within two weeks. I'm like, I'm learning from these guys. I'm like, these guys know stuff I know. So, you know, don't let your ego get in the way. Always stay humble. Always try to improve who you are and always give back to other people. There's something really magical and mystical that happens when you when you take the time to make sure that somebody else knows what you know or help answer any questions that they have. So, like I said, I'm a big, big fan of giving back. Nice. Now, if some of our listeners wanted to reach out and maybe find out more about you and, and your sound effect libraries and your books and all those things, uh, what's the best way to do that? You can go to my website, rickveers.com, R I C. V I E R S. And that's pretty much the best way to get a hold of me. I'm on social media. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, again, just Rick Veers, R I C V I E R S. All right. Well, I want to say a big thanks to Rick Veers for being on the show today. Thanks for having me, man. And don't forget to visit floridasoundman.com to find out more about the Quiet Please Filming in Progress sign and the Lab Organizer. Just visit the product page and use promo code LSP for a 10% discount. That's floridasoundman.com. Until next time, remember, sound is half the picture.